Hey everyone, welcome to the Doctors Are Running podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, talk about the art and the science of what we're putting on our feet and how we're moving. Today I have Andrew with me, and we're going to talk about a very common running myth, specifically what everybody's probably heard is, is running bad for your knees? So Andrew, what do you think? Is running bad for your knees? Well, the literature does not support that statement, which is what we're going to be talking about for the next hour or so. Um, yeah. But it's one of the most common myths that I hear patients and friends say. So, oh, you know, you shouldn't run that much. It's going to hurt your knees. You're going to get arthritis. But it's really not true. And for some people, it can actually help your knees. Right, Matt? Yeah. So we'll definitely talk about that. But I think one of our... What was our subjective question again? What's the most common running related yeah, myth that's, that you've that's got heard? It. Yeah, we're just going to leave that my mistake in there. Um, so there, you know, people hear things like this all the time, and some of the stuff gets perpetuated. Some things may have an ounce of truth to them. Other things often don't. This is definitely one of the things that it does not. There are some mild exceptions to this, which we'll talk about. But yeah, that's our biggest subjective question: is what running myths have you heard? So again, and I, your same exact thing. I hear this all the time from not only other runners, but I've heard this from patients every time. Like, oh, like I, I had a patient just last week. Oh, I saw you running the other day. Like, don't you know that's bad for your knees? And I'm like, I'm the one seeing you for knee pain, not the other way around. Right. So no, I'm just kidding. I'm just judging, but I'm not judging on that. But yeah, everybody <laughs> seems to think that if you ask any, that's the first thing people think about oftentimes with running that if they're not, oh, how are your knees? I'm like, I have right. full mobility and my, I have no crepitus actually in my joints, despite running 80 miles a week for the last 12 years. So that's amazing, man. Yeah. So. Um, I saw a funny meme related to this topic that said, does running hurt your knees? My knees are the only thing that doesn't hurt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, for a lot I of like people. That. Yeah. <laughs> that can so totally we'll be true. It can. So just going straight out, uh, straight out the door, running is not bad for your knees. And this has actually been supported by research going all the way back to the 80s. They have looked at this over and over and over yeah. and over again and continue to find that not only is running not bad for your knees, in many ways, it can actually be protective. But Andrew, when somebody says something's bad for your joints, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? Well, I, th I think it can mean a lot depending who it's coming from, right? I think to like the general public, if someone says, oh, that's bad for your joints, at the most basic level, they mean, well, it's going to make them hurt. But I think when people say, oh, running is bad for your knees, they often do mean, oh, you're going to get arthritis or you're going to get a meniscus tear or just generally running's going to make your knees hurt. Um, but as we're going to talk about that is definitely not the case. Right. So just clarifying for everybody what, when people talk about, oh, it's bad for your knees, usually they're referring to the actual joints of, of your knee. So the, the knee is a very interesting, it's not actually more than just one joint. You have the femur top bone, that big long bone that comes down. You have the tibia that comes up from underneath and you actually have the small kneecap, which is actually a bone in and of itself. So there's actually two, sometimes people might argue more than that, two major joints there. See the tibial femoral joint and then the patella femoral joint. A joint is a connection point between two bones. Typically when you're younger, usually, those surfaces are usually fairly, the surfaces of the bone are fairly smooth. As you get older, that can change and doesn't necessarily always mean your function's gonna change, but sometimes those can change a little bit where it might be a little bit rougher, right? That's where um, some of the things that we'll talk about, can they typically name that? So maybe it might not slide as well as it might, Ironically, I see people all the time in their 80s and 90s that have like the worst looking x-rays and they still have great range of motion. I'm like, mm -hmm. imaging doesn't always match. But people also need to realize that joints are alive. So people will usually think skin, bone, muscle, that's alive. But there's actually a connective tissue that surrounds the joint itself and it's, it's very much alive. It needs yep. mobility, it needs movement because it acts very much like a sponge. The more you move it appropriately, the more it kind of helps squish out old waste products and stuff like that and the more it brings in new nutrition. So there's fluid in there. There's all, it's an entire environment and living structure. And like anything else in the rest of the body, it's got to move. Right. That fluid in the joint is called synovial fluid. And it has a lot of nutrients that actually bathe the cartilage and the knee. It bathes your menisci. 
So movement is what helps pump that fluid around. So that's why when people have pain, often moving can make them feel better than just sitting and doing nothing. Because as you get that fluid moving, I tell patients all the time, getting your knees moving is like giving yourself a shot at WD-40. You're going to feel better after moving than if you spent the same amount of time sitting on the couch. The other phrase I like to use with people, which sometimes I've now realized people are giving me weird looks because they might think this is something else. But the phrase that I like to use is motion is lotion, right? Uh -huh. The more you move, the more yep. that kind of lubricates the joint and things move, right? It's the same thing. So there's also, right. as, as Andrew mentioned, there's cartilage in a lot of joints. What That's basically a, as an extra set of cushioning. As oftentimes when they're younger, you usually have a little bit more. As you get older, normally you'll get, you might have a little bit less. That's how things go. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to affect or function. Right. Any other joint things that I missed? Any other anatomy um, I pieces? Think maybe talking about how cartilage actually responds to the load that we put on it. So yeah, I think a lot of people are familiar with the fact that bone responds to load. So hmm. if we want to build better bone density, we need to perform weight bearing or high impact exercise to help build up that bone. So similarly, cartilage responds to loads. Yes. Also, that, that there's actually a principle around bone loading called Wolf's Law that states that the, yes. bone, the tissue will respond to the stress placed upon it. This is really mm -hmm. important for people with osteoporosis or weakening of the right. bone. If you do not place appropriate load through the bone, it's not going to get stronger and it's not going to become more right. dense, which is why people love swimming is awesome. But the problem is, especially people with osteoporosis and building bone density, if you don't get weight bearing exercise or activity in there, it's not going to stimulate bone growth. So the tissues respond to the place forces placed upon them. Right. Yeah. Actually, I, one of the coolest features of bone, and this is a totally nerdy thing to say, but it is cool, is bones have lines in them based on how the bone is built up according to the stresses that you place on them. So doing multi-directional weight-bearing exercise is really the best thing you can do for your bones because that makes it as strong as possible. If you're only loading your bones in a certain movement pattern, that's how they're going to get built up. But if you, so for example, as a runner, we move in the sagittal plane, we flexion and extension, but doing some lateral movements like side to side hopping type movements stresses your bone and cartilage actually in ways that you're not typically stressing them when you're running, unless you're trail running where you are making a lot of side to side movements. Um, so the best thing for the body is a multitude of stresses that aren't too great um, and aren't haven't been ramped up too quickly. And I guess that's a good summary of yeah. a lot of uh, sports injury um, <laughs> science. It, that that the comment you made about like hey the, those multi-directional movements are so important reminded me of a patient that i had she's very high level elite masters runner and she's like i'm running like 80 100 miles a week she goes i've almost never had injuries i've had things here and there before but then i was out in my garden and i stepped on an ankle uh, not an ankle stepped on a acorn rolled my ankle and that's what caused me an ankle fracture i've run all these wow. miles i've done road marathons and all this kind of stuff. And it's a stupid acorn that broke my ankle. And I was like, right. oh, well, that kind of, it makes sense a little bit because you get what you trained. You've only exactly. been training load in one direction. And this is somebody mm -hmm. who did not do any trail running, any lateral movement. It was front to back. And yeah. that was kind of a wake up call for her to go, oh, I didn't realize, as you mentioned, that it's the entire bone you got to load. So some multi-directional stuff is important, which runners are terrible at. Unless yes. you're a trail runner, because that literally forces you to do that. So that was a, that was right. an interesting situation. Where I that was when I was very young. I was like very new clinician. I did not understand until somebody explained to me, and I was like, mm -hmm. "Oh, that's why." Got it. Yeah. So yes, yeah, multi-directional I, movements are important. Training is all about specificity. So mm -hmm. your body responds to what you ask of it. So if you have never introduced a particular movement pattern your body is probably not going to be super prepared for that movement pattern. So runners do multi-directional movements, your mm -hmm. bones, muscles, cartilage, everything will thank you. Right. So now as we've kind of gone over the anatomy of the joint, let's talk about the scary word that everybody hates hearing, but can actually be somewhat normal. 
So what is osteoarthritis? When people say, oh, running is bad for my knees, they're usually mm -hmm. referring to that you're going to get osteoarthritis either in the tibiofemoral joint or the patellofemoral joint or both. So right. what is that? And the reason I ask what is that is I probably 99% of, of patients that I work with, they come in with a diagnosis of OA or osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. and like They're freaking out. I'm like, did anybody explain what that is? And 99% will be like, I no, I have no idea what it is. You're freaking right. out, not, right? This, you have no idea? I think like, people oh. have, like, yeah. there's so many, like, fear-based terms associated mm. with osteoarthritis. How many patients have come into your office and said, oh, the doctor said that I'm bone on bone? Yes. And that is extremely rare for that to actually be the case. Yeah. Your cartilage could have thinned out tremendously, but your bones are literally not touching each other. Mm -hmm. um, so to get back to your question, Matt, osteoarthritis is a degenerative joint disease. So degenerative means it happens over time. Um, it's where the cartilage of the joint wears out. It can also include the bone if it gets really severe, um, but primarily you see changes in cartilage. And usually this is degenerative. And so when I see a 20 year old that comes in with an osteoarthritis diagnosis, that usually irritates me beyond all belief, because you can have a inflammatory response and an irritation of the joint. It doesn't mean it's full on like degenerative osteoarthritis. And that's exactly. where people get panicked. Like I'm 20 or 30 and they diagnose me with osteoarthritis. And I'm like, you know, that you have an, <laughs> you have an inflammatory response in your joint because you pissed it right. off. Right. And you earned yeah. that. But you don't have OA. Don't worry. No. This is this is we just like any tissue, right? You can have a muscle strain. You can have a mm -hmm. ligament sprain. The joint can also get irritated, and it, they'll flame yes. up, right? So one of the classic ways, especially with joint irritations, is people like for the knee, like it'll puff up because joints. Yep. There's a lot of fluid and blood flow in there. When you irritate mm -hmm. those, they puff, they swell yep. up, and so yeah. That happens, right? So that's a joint irritation. Doesn't mean it's OA though. For people right. that do have it, right, as you're getting older, what's really interesting is we found that you, osteoarthritis is like death and taxes. You're, it's gonna happen at some point, right? You're exactly. hopefully, yeah. hopefully you live long enough to have some overuse injuries, right? That that's or like just overuse in general. As you get older, mm -hmm. things wear out a little bit. The interesting yeah. part is just because they're wearing out doesn't mean they're not they're gonna stop working. Right. So I've had, right. and the classic way you'll see this and the best way to describe osteoarthritis is that those smooth joint surfaces I talked about as you get older or as you've been loading that, they aren't always smooth anymore. As Andrew mentioned, bone responds to stress and all these tissues respond to stress. So sometimes those smooth surfaces will become a little bit more jagged, especially as if you've been loading one particular area a lot, the bone will grow out in response to that stress. If it's going, well, I either do this or I break. So let's, let's not break. So yeah. you'll, it'll, it won't be as smooth as it once was. Now that's normal. That's just what joints do oftentimes. Osteoarthritis, itis means an inflammatory condition. So sometimes those, that those surfaces or something in the joint can get irritated. Sometimes some of that, the way that's designed can place you at a little higher risk for an inflammatory response, just because things may not be as smooth as they once were. That's not always true, but osteoarthritis really refers to, Hey, there's been some degenerative changes at the joint. It either is irritated or there's a higher risk for it to be irritated. There's some things you can work on to make sure this doesn't get irritated or reduce that risk, but it doesn't mean it's over, right? So we see people in that I, I see people that have imaging all the time. Like you get the 89 year old that comes in bouncing the clinic going, Hey, I got hurry up. Let's go. I'm like you jumped in here and your imaging looks terrible. Mm -hmm. It looks like you have these just jagged edges and there's no joint spate left. But when I'm moving everything, it moves great. Right. And this happens Imaging all the time. is not destiny, right, no. Matt? So yeah, not at all. I think, I think now would be a good time for us to differentiate between the two types of osteoarthritis, which yeah. are radiographic osteoarthritis and yep. symptomatic osteoarthritis. So there are right. lots of us walking around right now who, if you did an x-ray of every joint in our body, we'd probably have evidence of osteoarthritis on x-ray. But we might feel completely normal, no pain, no range of motion restrictions. We can do everything we want to do. So that's when Matt said, like, these normal degenerative changes that occur as we age, that's what he's talking about. And, you know, in the spine, it's normal for even people in their 30s to show early degenerative changes. So 
And I don't think that doctors always do a very good job of explaining that to people. So let's say you go into a doctor and your neck hurts and they do an x-ray and, oh, well, you've got some early degenerative changes. You've got a little disc space narrowing and you're 35. Well, you probably have had that for a few years, but that's probably not what's causing your pain. But now you've got a patient who thinks, oh, no, you know, I have arthritis. I'm too young to have arthritis. Does this mean that my spine is going to crumble by the time I'm 50? Like the way that we as medical practitioners talk about what is going on with a patient's body is really important. Because if you instill fear about someone's condition unnecessarily, you are absolutely influencing their well-being for the worst. You should educate your patients, but you should make sure to not give them the wrong impression about what is actually going on. Some of the, the radiologists I work with have been, I, would, I noticed this recently because we were talking about this, on all their imaging stuff, they'll say normal degenerative changes, yeah. changes associated with age, <laughs> normal. Right. Because people will go read their own imaging, which you should, right? That's your information. Yeah. Right? People are like, oh mm -hmm. my gosh, what the heck is this? And it's like, this is normal, right? Because we, right. you know, you talk about the spine, that is such a great example because there's been some very good evidence done on like aging spines and people that have pain and don't have pain and people will have zero pain and no history of back pain and have mm -hmm. disc herniations, joint yep. arthropathy, right? So it's like joints not moving anymore, all kinds of stuff. And you're like, do you have back pain? I'm like I have never had back pain. And you're like, right. So imaging yeah. is really is, is, can be very important to do. But the problem is if the image doesn't match their symptoms, Mm -hmm. then you're not going to worry on about the image as much. You've got to worry about the patient in front of you and how they're presented. Exactly. I've actually had the opposite. I've had situations where somebody's like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is like, this thing is really cleared up. This sounds like a joint problem, right? All the mm -hmm. evidence you told me how you're moving suggests, and then they go to get imaging and it's totally clear. And the patient's like, oh, I'm like that. It's just checking. Make sure you don't have like right. a spinal cord, like rupture or something like that. Right. So yes. just, don't worry about that. So yep. keep moving. Yeah, and I think that's another good point, Matt, with regards to like helping patients understand their pain. Just because you have normal imaging doesn't mean that your pain is all in your head. There are so many things that can cause pain that don't show up on an x-ray or an MRI. So like you said, imaging, one is to make sure that something severe isn't going on, like a tumor or a fracture or something. Right. But just because your imaging doesn't show a problem doesn't mean that you don't have something that right. needs help. Conversely, if your imaging shows a problem, that problem might not be what's causing your pain. And that's where a good doctor and a good physical therapist really come in to actually spend time with you, listen to you, and figure out, okay, this is what this person is complaining of. Now let's figure out why that happened, if <laughs> we can figure out why and what to do about it. Right. We don't always know. There are some problems where we will never know the structure that caused their pain, but we can make their pain go away. And really, in the end, that's what matters. People right. don't care. Like, they just want to be out of pain. If you can't come up with, like, a completely precise explanation for why they have pain, like, oh, it is this muscle that is causing your pain, they don't care. They just want their pain to go away. If you can do that as a clinician, that's the key thing. Yeah, that's really important. I one thing that I always ask my patients right now is, what are your goals coming into this? Like, what right. can you really make mm -hmm. sure to get out of this? Because if you don't yeah. tell me, you, you know that meme. For, I think it's from Always Sunny in Philadelphia, where the guys like got all this stuff in the background, all the um, like the charts and the like the lines drawn everywhere, and he like he's like this. That's what happens to me if you let me go on long enough about talking about the why, but then most of them, like, people, like, I'm like, they don't care. Like, how do I just not hurt? I'm like, oh, my bad. Exactly, so, yeah. Yeah, so having yeah. somebody who understands what you're looking for to kind of either explain or going, just get me out of pain, right? It's really right. important. And so what's interesting is sometimes, you, like you said, you don't even know how to have to know what the diagnosis is, but there's some kind of pretty clear factors you have to get stuff moving the right way, take time to load the right way, yep. a lot of stuff. It's sometimes just time. Time can make things right. better as well. It's amazing. Yes, absolutely. Make super complicated. Yeah. So, yeah. so um, back to arthritis <laughs> of the knees. We so, definitely need to do a pain talk at some point on here, by the way. Yes, I know we talked about that we earlier. We definitely but do. We'll, we'll yeah. stick that in there for the listeners and viewers. And we're 
Andrew and I will probably go to town on that. So yes, I think that could be like a uh, yeah. multi-episode topic. That's going to be a multi-episode topic. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it would be good for our listeners to know what some actual risk factors are for arthritis yeah. of the knees. You know, we're talking about how running either doesn't cause arthritis of the knees or might actually reduce your risk of yep. getting knee arthritis. So, Matt, what are some factors that we actually know can cause arthritis? So there's a lot of different. One of the things, ironically, we know is a lack of activity can actually right. increase your risk of osteoarthritis. Because yeah. as we mentioned, you need appropriate movement. So yes. looking at runners specifically, we found that people with mild to moderate mileage, there's, there's some research we'll reference on here. Runners with mild to moderate mileage typically have a lower risk of osteoarthritis, even than the normal population. Okay. Yep. Those who are not active tend to actually have a higher risk. So, and this, this has actually been expanded beyond running is that a lack of activity appropriate activity can be a risk factor excessive abnormal activity can definitely be a risk factor so i we were talking about this beforehand but some of the biggest risk factors for osteoarthritis is actually your occupation so if you're in an occupation where you've got to be kneeling and squatting all day long for years right that is probably overloading the joint beyond a way that it can recover from going for an hour run is one thing, but we're doing eight, 10 hour days of kneeling, load it, compress the joint, all that kind of stuff. That can actually be a very large risk factor, actually far more of a risk factor than a lot of different sports, especially yeah. running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think one of the other biggest risk factors for developing arthritis in your knees is having a prior injury to your knee. Yeah. So how many, you know, people played soccer or basketball in high school and, you know, tore their ACL or tore their meniscus or had a really bad ankle sprain. That injury to ligaments of a joint can affect the both the stability, of course, of the joint, but also even if you have that torn ligament repaired, it can affect the biomechanics of the joint after you've had the repair and you've gone through therapy. And that's actually one of the greatest risk factors for developing arthritis in the knee, in the ankle. So if you think about how many people did that in high school and then, you know, in their thirties or forties take up running and oh no, they have arthritis in their knee and their knee hurts because they run. But it wasn't the running that gave them the arthritis. It probably was the injury they had when they were younger. Do we, do we have research on like instant, like if you add additional activity, I'd, that'd be curious because we'll, 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 we're talking about how running actually might d decrease the risk of OA. I wonder, I wonder if there's any, I don't know, but I wonder if there's any research on people that have had some of those surgeries and can you decrease it with other activities? Because the thing that we do oh, know <laughs> about both cartilage as well as the actual joint itself, so the cushion and the joint, is running actually acts to help build the resiliency of those tissues. So you used to think that, hey, cartilage wears out, that's it, it's over, you're done. There's been some very interesting research recently that not only can you actually build resiliency in it with appropriate load, so it's, which running does, so it, running helps cartilage get used to dealing with stuff that actually mm -hmm. strengthens isn't the right word because it's not like the tissue hypertrophy is like the same way a muscle does, but it becomes more resilient, it can handle more. Right. The joint surfaces mm -hmm. are actually the same, right? And it's the same thing with the battling osteoporosis that the joints actually become stronger, they can handle more. So I wonder if that could reduce some of the risk factors with anybody that has that, because we do know long-term that a lot of those individuals that have had some of the surgeries, they certainly are at risk and we don't have the evidence for prevention yet. But my thought would, you got to stay moving because especially if you've right. had one of those surgeries and then you stop moving, right? Exactly. We already know yeah, a lack of movement is a, your sport. Yeah. Right. A lack of movement mm -hmm. is a big risk factor. So yeah. I wonder if, hey, like, so yeah, as you said, people will start taking up running. They go, hey, I've got this joint irritation. Was it actually from the running or was it from an old surgery? Was it from an abnormal movement pattern? So what we want to address is that running itself is not bad for your joints. Abnormal movement patterns that place additional torque on the joint that in a way that it can't recover from that might irritate things for sure. Right. And but then we also see people with weird movement patterns that have no pain and never get joint irritation. So that's okay. For, don't go with that rabbit hole. <laughs> <It's> bad. <laughs> well, you know, just yeah. to 
make one example. Yeah. So if you had someone with an ACL tear who had it yeah. reconstructed, we're seeing research emerging in like the past five to seven years that like the amount of time it takes to return to sport should actually be much longer than what oh, it was yeah. previously thought. Um, the big focus again, which has always been the focus, but making sure that like quad hamstring strength is balanced, not letting someone become quad dominant. A lot of people probably don't know, um, the hamstrings actually kind of act as like the backup to your ACL. Yes. So if you have nice, strong hamstrings and you've torn your ACL and had it reconstructed, your hamstrings can actually serve as a little bit of a backstop to it. Yeah. Um, but it's so easy to overstrengthen your quads and easy to not do enough strengthening for your hamstrings. So I would say the most important thing, let's say you're a high school or college athlete who tore your ACL, go through a complete rehab program, including like the last phase, like beyond six months post-op where you're getting functional strength testing, looking at single leg hopping, maybe getting some actual um, like objective strength measurements with a dynamometer, because that's really where the imbalance in strength is teased out. You know, manual muscle testing, which is what PTs do in the clinics, is so insensitive when people get above like a pretty basic level of strength. So a person can have an imbalance in quad and hamstring strength and a PT in a clinic isn't going to be able to tell just by manual muscle testing. So if you've torn your ACL, do a complete rehab program. Yep. Keep working at it to get like your single leg hop distance up. Keep working at like high level, like single leg hopping, squatting, lunging all of those functional movements before trying to go back to your sport. Because people are, are at much higher risk of re-injury if they return to sport too soon. And we now know that too soon is a lot later than we used to think. People love watching elite athletes, especially in soccer or football, go, wow, they, they got back after their ACL tear and like, a month and a half. And every time I hear that, I'm like, well, that ACL is going to go really quick. And if it doesn't go yep. there, that's the group that's going to have osteoarthritic changes pretty quick. Cause you're going to just exactly. be cheering on that, on that stuff. Even with some of the new advances in muscle strengthening, like blood flow restriction training, mm -hmm. some of those tissues just need time to recover. If it's not right. the muscles, sometimes even the ACL itself actually has its own healing timeline and you cannot yeah. rush that. And yeah. so it includes the joint they cut into. So it does take time. And yeah, those super elite athletes that you see have very, very horrible post-career injuries and arthritic changes okay. it is not super yeah. fun. So you yeah. don't want to be that. There are often, no, when you see a professional athlete get back to playing soccer six months post-op ACL, that person is doing that because they're doing it for their career, yep. not for their long-term health. Yeah. You, if you are not a professional athlete, and even if you are, you might take your long-term health into greater consideration. Yep. yep. It'd probably be a good thing. So speaking of elite athletes, so some of the research that we've seen so far on risk factors for OA. So we mentioned that runners that are, that run mild to moderate mileage, and Andrew's going to come in and help me make this a little bit more clear. Cause it's going to be a little bit vague at first. Runners with mild to moderate mi mileage tend to have a low risk of osteoarthritis. In fact, it actually tends to decrease your risk, especially compared to people that are not active. The group that seems to have a higher risk of OA, of joint irritate, joint degeneration later on, is those that, what they termed, this research article said, elite runners or extremely high mileage runners tended to have a higher risk of osteoarthritis and degenerative changes with, over time. Now, what does that what does that mean? What did that make you think when we talked about that? Well, so one thing that, you know, Matt and I looked at many articles on this topic and a couple of meta analyses and a systematic review, and they all vary in their definition of what an elite runner is and what a recreational runner is. It seems that like the the range for recreational runner is like 10 to 20 miles a week. So that's not a lot of running. 
the definition for elite runners was all over the place. One yeah. study was like 92 kilometers a week, which is like a little more than 50 miles a week. But other studies didn't define it as tightly or let runners self-define. So we can't really say that there's like a mileage cutoff per week that people should stay under if they want to you know, maybe reduce the risk of knee osteoarthritis. So as with any study involving humans, it's hard to um, design the study to make it both valid and applicable to a wide population. So when you look at several studies on a topic and try to group all of their um, subject groups together, you'll get huge variation in like how they defined elite or how they defined recreational. Um, so unfortunately, oh, I think I cut out there for a minute, didn't I, Matt? Yeah, you did for a second. Um, yeah, okay. Um, basically, we can't give you like, you should run below 50 miles a week and no. your knees will be okay. There's mm -hmm. no research that has defined what that like upper limit is. Um, but we can talk a little bit about why there might be some sort of upper limit, and it has to do with how cartilage and bone respond to load. And this makes sense from a training perspective too, right? Like if you're a runner who's been running 30 miles a week for five years, and you decide that you're going to be a super runner and now you're going to run 70 miles a week, you're probably going to get injured because now you have vastly exceeded multiple types of tissues tolerance for the load that you're putting on them. Unless of um, course you give yourself months and months and months and months, potentially years to oh, build up yes. from that. No, 30, I meant like yeah, 31 yeah. week, 70 the next week. Yeah. Yep. You could build from 30 to 70, but it has to be gradual because right. tissue responds to progressively increased loads. Right. So it, it's just like training we get fitter by stressing our body and then giving it a chance to recover. But if you don't give your body a chance to recover, that's where you start to get sick, injured, whatever. Similarly, cartilage responds to progressively increased load. But if you increase the load too quickly and don't give it time to recover, it's not going to become stronger and more resilient. It's going to break down and stay broken down. And that's where people are going to be more likely to develop knee injury, possibly arthritis. And I think it is, that's right on the money with that, where it's, I think when they're trying to define elite runners, it's probably people that are training at such high intensity that really there, there's not a balance between their ability to recover and their ability to work out, which it makes, I mean, so, right. so you have somebody who's a professional, right? They're probably oftentimes going to be at that point. And you're, you're seeing some mm -hmm. people who are starting to challenge that. Like, look at people who have had these super long careers, like Sarah Hall and stuff like that. Well, mm -hmm. we don't know what we don't, we don't have any information on what her, any injury she might be dealing with, but you know, she's had a very long career. And I think being able to balance recovery, she's got a great coach too, right? So it was yeah. previously, uh, is she getting coached by her husband now? It's Ryan Hall. I think so. Who else is it? She has another coach. Don't quote me on that. That's really bad. But having having somebody who can help guide you in balancing recovery and stress is the two really important parts because you get you do not get stronger with the stress part with the actual workout. You get stronger with the recovery. If that's right. in balance, some of that stuff's going to start getting overworked. You might see some changes there. So even and like you said, if even if somebody's a thirty mile a week runner, 50, 60, 80, if their bodies can adapt and get used to that, they might be okay. But it's the people that aren't doing that, whether you are not active and have zero movement or too much without recovery is the problem. And what's funny is I was looking, I was like, well, what does too much mean? What if I go look at some of the literature for ultra marathoners? And there's not a ton of research on this. So anybody that's interested in the area, that is wide open. Some of the early evidence has been looking, watching people do ultra marathons, their joints will swell up. Right, you are pounding those things mm -hmm. for 50, 80, 100 miles. So joint swelling is totally normal. It happens, yep. right? The cartilage is getting irritated. But actually, the early studies, now they haven't done with large group studies, but the early studies have shown the exact same thing no higher risk of osteoarthritis in a lot of these ultra marathon runners. 
yes, the joints swell up. They yeah. can clearly get irritated. But if you give it enough time to adapt and balance that recovery, it's amazing what you can do. I'm not suggesting, right. suggesting that everybody go out and do ultra marathons, but if you give it time, it's amazing. Right. Yeah. I think the idea of stress followed by recovery is applicable to so many topics in running and in sports science in general, but it makes sense why someone who's only running 10 to 20 miles a week would it could be beneficial for your knees right. because you're stressing your cartilage, but you're also giving yep. it plenty of time to recover. Um, by stressing it, it's making it stronger, more resilient, more able to respond to that similar load the next time you do it. Right. You know, when you think about whatever each of these studies considered to be elite level runners, those runners are typically training like right on the razor's edge of yep. healthy and unhealthy. So, and often they cross over into the unhealthy range. When you think about just like, if you looked at all of the athletes in say like the U.S. national championships, right. how many of them had dealt with an injury in the past year? There's probably a pretty high number, right? Because Most they are them. on that yeah. Yeah. very thin line of healthy versus injured. Right. So when you're trying to squeeze it, out every bit of performance you are definitely on that so do, do, by the way shooting for a world record is not good for your health just fyi no <laughs> definitely not no nope. yeah and you know you talked about sarah hall and we talked about how you run 80 miles a week and you've been able to do that yeah. for 10 years yeah most people most elite runners do not run 100 plus miles a week for 20 years that is very rare no so you might have a professional runner who trains at that level for five years, maybe 10 years. Some people are lucky enough to make it longer than that, but some of them also have to take extended time off for injuries mm -hmm. and to let their bodies yeah. recover. So comparing elite runners to recreational runners, there's so many other factors yeah. that could affect why they might be more likely to develop arthritis. Um, it's it's hard to compare. It would be interesting to see more research on like the 30 to 40 mile a week yeah. runner, because I think that's like the recreational but competitive runner. That's kind yeah. of the level they're at. Yeah. And I think that would help answer patients questions and also our questions as clinicians in guiding people on what's best for their overall health. Yep. Yeah. That's actually what the study that I am setting up right now, that is my requirement is getting somewhere in that 30 to 40 mile uh, uh, a week range to be an accurate description of what most people out there, a lot of the, you know, the recreational runners, stuff like that. So it might even need to be yep. 20 to 40, but most people are going to be right. They're not going to be running 80, hundred mile weeks. Only crazy people do that. Right. That's dumb. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so most people are going to do that just based on time and other factors. There's also, this is a really great thing that I learned from Steve Magnus or anybody that's interested in some of the like performance stuff and peak performance is a great book that everybody has a different limit, right? So we right. all have different, there's there, I knew people throughout both elite as well as in high school, college, like phenomenally fast athletes, but they could not run over a certain mileage or they would get hurt or mm -hmm. they could not do a certain amount. Whereas you had people like me who like, you know, what worked quite as fast, but I could handle mileage and mileage and mileage and different people can handle mm -hmm. different things. So, so especially right. when it comes to injuries or a definitely osteoarthritis and arthritic changes or just the joints in general, you have to figure out what works for you. And I know you hear that from us all the time, especially in relation to shoes, but this is especially important here with going, how much mm -hmm. can your body handle, how much can you do while still being able to recover and stay healthy. Because if you can't stay healthy, right. you're not going to be consistent, and that's what's going to slow you down. Yeah. I think that's a really good point, Matt, because, I mean, runners, just like everyone, we tend to compare yeah. ourselves to others. And let's say your goal is to qualify for Boston, and your friend qualified for Boston, and they did it running 60 miles a week. Well, then you think you have to run 60 miles a week. But that might not be the optimal weekly volume for you. You might need to run less. You might need to run more. Either way, again, it's about gradually increasing your load, making sure that you're giving your body enough time to recover from the load you're putting it under. But we all, 
we all respond to training differently and we all need slightly different types of training. You know, we can get into like the science yeah. of muscle fiber types right. and whatever, yeah. but yeah. that's another episode. That's another episode. Or two. Yeah. Speak, speaking but, of how, how we, oh, go for it. Well, just in general, everybody, in, when it comes to your training, you're an individual and you try to figure out what works best for you. Get a coach, get a PT who can help you, but don't look at what, you know, your friend is doing or a pro on Instagram is doing because you're not them. Nope. And oftentimes you don't want to be them, to be honest. But yeah. that's a different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so we've talked about the fact that yes, there are there might be some things that might be associated with osteoarthritis, but for the most part, based on the research consistently over the last twenty plus years since the eighties, not only is there no association with running and osteoarthritis, it's actually found to be protective against joint problems, even in the knee. So that whole myth we could bust on that. However, right. that being said, there are some other ways you might be able to prevent any kind of joint related changes or at least reduce the risk of things getting irritated. You probably will get osteoarthritis. Whether or not you notice or have pain is a different story. So Andrew, what are some things that people can do universally to try to reduce that risk of things getting irritated, trying to stay healthy? Well, number one, I, in the most general sense, staying active, which means yep. both getting regular cardiovascular activity doing strength training, performing like balance or stability training. Um, we know that weight is a risk factor for osteoarthritis. So maintaining a healthy weight, whatever that is for you. Similarly, a healthy weight for you is not the same as the healthy weight for your friend. So you have to figure out what the right weight is for you. Your doctor can help you figure that out too. Um, PTs are great at helping people with osteoarthritis prevention programs, um, because we are the movement experts. Um, but like we talked about before, the body responds to the stresses you put on it. So it's better to vary the type of exercise you do rather than doing the same type of cardio, like don't just run or the same strength training. Don't just do the same 10 exercises in the same order with the same weight three days a week. Your body responds to new challenge and stimulus. So whether that means running a few days a week, cycling a couple days a week, swimming, mixing it up so that you're challenging both your joints and your muscles in different ways. When it comes to strength training, trying to do different movements that target similar muscle groups. So that means maybe don't just go to the gym and use like the Cybex machines, get off the machines and do some like body weight stuff, um, do free weights, challenge your body in different planes of motion. So like I mentioned earlier, running is what we call a sagittal plane activity. So flexion and extension. Running doesn't involve a lot of rotation or side to side movement unless you're doing trail running or unless you're weaving around people in a really crowded race. But for the most part, we're moving this way. So make sure to challenge yourself in doing lateral movements or rotation type movements. Um, anything that you specifically use with your patients um, when talking about like osteoarthritis prevention or treatment, Matt? Yeah, one of the, the biggest things, especially with age, is working on your strength. Because the joint, right, it adapts. But the thing that really mm -hmm. protects the joint, especially with osteoarthritis as it gets older, is having more muscle strength. Because so once, right. if, if your cartilage starts to wear down, that's not supporting you. So the only thing that's going to support you and create more joint space is how much muscle strength you have. Okay, Because yep. that's what's going to help the joint glide really, really nicely. That's what's going to be absorbing more force. So the stronger you can get appropriate, the better. And I totally agree, Andrew, that having a variety of different motions is really key. Because if you just train the same thing all the time, you're going to get good at that one thing. But as soon as you have any other variation of that, you're going to run into trouble. So a little variety can be helpful. So some of the road runners out there, you might benefit from a little bit of trail running. Some of the trail runners every once in a while might want to hop on the road just for a little bit or just try maybe a different trail or different so having a little variety right. mm -hmm. um the other things that kind of balancing out it out is always kind of check just a self-check going how's everything moving right do i mm -hmm. does it feel like you know going through 
can, does my hip move the way I need to? Do I ha- can I straighten my knee all the way? Can I bend my knee all the way? Can I does my ankle move the way I need to? And if it doesn't move, it might be good to work on a little bit of mobility work, right? Is it the yep. muscle? Is it the joint? We can't mm-hmm. tell you over this, right? You're gonna have to figure that out either or you know talk to a physical therapist or healthcare professional going, hey. Do I need to work on joint mobility? Do I need to work on stretching? Which one is it, right? Because that's where some of the evidence kind of gets a little fuzzy because sometimes some of the research studies have a trouble picking out which one thing it actually is, which is why stre- uh, stretching kind of struggled for a little bit. But whatever tissue might be limiting things, that's what you got to work on because you want to make sure right. everything moves as evenly and nice and glides as nicely as possible. Because when, when some things get too stiff, other things get a little bit uneven, that's where you can create some asymmetries that may irritate things. And the other thing that can yeah. be really helpful, especially for runners, with especially trail, is working on a little bit of stability work, right? Running is a series of single leg hops. You got to get comfortable yep. being on one leg. A mm-hmm. lot of the exercises I see people do, there's nothing wrong with it. Squats, deadlifts, those are great. If that's what you want to focus on, awesome. But if you want to create a program that can really benefit running, it can be very helpful to add a little bit of single leg variety in there because you got to get comfortable with that. And that does not, yeah. I mean... If you've got some instabilities, maybe working on unstable surface stuff can be helpful. But we also know unstable surfaces and strength and like high level strength training can actually improve balance together. So I have to say, hey, why not do both? Yeah. So kind of I making sure another, you're well rounded. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well rounded is key. And on that topic, so let's say you're. Main concern is I really don't want to get arthritis in my knee. My parents yep. have arthritis in their knees, and yep. what can I do? So don't just focus on your knees. There's a ton of research that says for people who have knee arthritis, if you work on lumbar spine mobility and core stability, you're going to help their knee pain. So similarly, if you want to prevent getting an injury in your knee, don't just focus on that part of your body. Make sure that your back moves normally. Make sure your hips move normally. Like Matt said, work on your core strength even work on your upper body strength. You know, as yep. runners, we like to have little like T-Rex arms and we don't want to have any upper body muscle at all, right? But that's wrong. Upper body muscle helps us pump our arms better. It helps us fatigue less. So work on your whole body. Don't just focus on your hips right. down as so many runners do. There, there's actually a term for this. It's called regional interdependence, yes. which is about the fact that even everything, you know, and people will sometimes get annoyed at this going like, are you saying like what's happening at my neck is affecting my foot? It's like, uh, it depends on the person. I mean, I would be a little more local than that, but you sh- do know that your entire body is related. So if you're going to work right. on strength, you probably should be working on everything. My biggest yes. argument for why runners should work on upper body strength, and this is because I not only see this in runners, I see this in the normal population as well. You need good trunk rotation for exactly. often movement. If your yep. thoracic spine doesn't move enough, what often happens, like you don't have enough rotation, you either start move, getting that excessively through your lumbar spine, which can be a little bit annoying because the lumbar spine does not like doing that. Like the actual right. joints are not made to do that. Or you might get start getting excessive rotation farther down the chain. So making sure yep. everything moves is really, really good. This is not to make you paranoid, right? If you're doing fine, don't worry. But it's another reason going, adding a little bit of upper body strength or mobility work is not a bad idea. Right. Yeah. Because trunk rotation helps us dissipate the forces that happen when our foot hits the ground. Right. So if you're stiff in your trunk, you're not dissipating those forces as well. And those forces are just going right. to stay in your lower extremities. Right. So yeah. And so many of us who have desk jobs, yep. we just sit and yep. we start getting rounded in our upper backs and yep. then we try to go for a run yep. and there's no mobility here. So doing daily trunk mobility exercises, yep. particularly to get your back straight yep. and to work on rotation right. is so key for everyone, but yep. for runners in particular. Please remember you get what you train. So you might yes. run for an hour or two. Remember that what happens the rest of the day can also impact that as well. It's the same thing we talked Absolutely. about that your occupation can be a risk factor for injury because you're going to be doing that most of the day. So always think, how can I get out of that? So we just talked about all these risk factors. What are what are things that running, well, let's end on a positive note. So what are things that running is good for? Running is great for so many things, as we all know, as runners. So I think for me, I think the number one most important thing running does, well, besides cardiovascular fitness and muscular fitness is bone density. So, 
you know that I spent many years just riding a bike and that does zero for bone density. So, you know, as I've gotten older, I've started to think about, okay, what can I do to stay healthy? And I realized that I really needed to start doing more higher impact stuff. So there's a lot of studies that have found that running can help improve bone density in your legs. There's mixed studies about whether it can improve bone density in your spine. Uh, one study I read actually found that it reduced bone density in the lumbar spine of male elite runners, but not females, um, which they they said they thought it might have been due to low energy availability, which, again, goes into this is why studying elite runners is not really applicable to the general population, because being on that razor's edge particularly with low energy availability, which basically means they're not eating enough to keep up with the calories they're burning. That is a huge risk factor for lower bone density in both men and women. Um, so if you have, if your doctor has told you you need to work on improving your bone density, either because you have osteopenia, you have a family history of it, running is one of the best exercises you can do. And if you're new to running, of course, make sure that you gradually increase how much time or distance you spend. You might start out with even just walk, jog to start. Um, but running is one of the top exercises to build lower extremity bone density for sure. One of the other things that can be really helpful, and there's increasing evidence on this, is stress reduction and mood. So there's a very powerful, in addition yeah. to lean body mass and then reducing kind of abnormal, like unwanted fat mass. Obviously you need some, that is very important that you need to have some fat on you. Cardiovascular fitness, bone density, but there's a lot of increasing research on the psychological impact and how positive that can be. It's so much so that even a lot of, I've been talking to some of the physicians about this, uh, cause I'm working in spine care, knowing a good psychologist can be very, very, a psychiatrist and psychologist can be very, very mm -hmm. helpful. Um, yep. that they've been prescribing not only exercise, but going, Hey, you might want to think if you, you are a little bit at risk for osteoporosis, you might want to think about running, which the first thing right. is, Oh, why would I do want to do running? That's bad for my knees. And then usually I, I hear, I get this email going, can you come talk to this person? <laughs> You've yelled at me about that. Why don't you tell them? But yeah, so yep. there's a really big psychological impact of improving cognitive abilities, mental health over a lifetime. And it's not just in younger people, it's also in older, it's all across the age band. Some very Absolutely. cool research that's been come out on this as well. So yeah. helps your bones, can help your muscles, can help your brain, all that kind of stuff. Although please be aware that running itself does not technically count as strength training, which is what my research is showing. So you do have to do a Ryan. little bit of strength training. Hill repeats are nice, but you do need to lift something slightly heavy every once in a while. It would be a question for you, Matt, since yeah. you're very up on the literature. It would be interesting to see if, like, mountain runners get more of a Ooh. strength benefit than, you know, runners who run on normal terrain. I have no, That's think? a great question, right? Because you got to deal with much higher, like, eccentric and that and lows like especially like climbing stuff we i always mm -hmm. hear coaches be like climbing is, is like hills are strength in disguise but also right. like the eccentric load coming down right that's a mm -hmm. lot of load I, that's a great question i don't know the answer yeah that. we'll have to do some uh, literature search and find we'll out the and then update the li I, listeners here i don't know if there's I, I i don't know if there's any research on that so anybody that's looking for a dissertation out there there you go yeah like strength differences between road, like road and trail runners. Oh, there's so many factors there. Right. Like how, okay. we, how would you measure strength? Right. Oh gosh. So, so, so far we have episodes that we need to talk about. We need to do a pain <laughs> science episode, which is going to be like 10 to a hundred episodes long. We yes. can do a whole other podcast on that. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, what was the, there was another one. Psychology. Oh yeah. The psychology yep. mm -hmm. of running would be really good. We need to get a good running psychologist on here. That would be really cool. Yes. And mm -hmm. then the last one would be differences in trail and road runners and see if there's any. Yes. I've seen a couple studies on like general, but I don't remember what they were about. I don't think they were strength stuff. So maybe that's our next recent doctor's running research topic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could take, you know, a, people who only road run yeah. and then assign them half of them continue doing their road only training and half of them start doing like mountain training 
and at the end of you know a sufficiently long study period test their strength in various ways and see if there's any differences so many variables there i don't even know I how know. to begin to control that yep but anyway, that's a whole other topic. We hope again that you <laughs> we've been able to appropriately bust this myth that running is not bad for your knees. In fact, it is actually can be protective for joints as long as you're doing you're moving enough, but also allowing enough time to recovery to recover. The joints are no different than any other tissue. They can be overworked. They can also the resilience of the tissues can be built up over time if you give them time to work to adapt to what you're doing to it. Strength training is always good, appropriate mobility work, and just trying to train smart. Sometimes certain people need a coach to have that happen, but running is not bad for your knees. So we really appreciate you listening. As always, we're here. We'll get, have a lot of really cool stuff coming out in the next couple, not only episodes, but in the next couple of months. We, again, please remember, this is now the Doctors Are Running podcast. I'm glad we got that right the first time. But we'll have a lot of new stuff. And again, we have the Doctors Are Running website as well. We've got all kinds of social media that you can follow us on. So we've got, as Bach always wants us to remind people, we do have LinkedIn. It's actually doing really well. But we have yep. Instagram, Facebook. We have Twitter. I forgot that he has that as well. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. What else do we have? All the social media sites that you can find there. Please check us out not only on YouTube, but we also have a website where we're doing full reviews and just have lots of stuff out there. It's been really fun to have such a great team that can create such great content. We also really appreciate people that actually answer the subjective questions because we do read that stuff and go, hey, it can not only give us ideas of where to go, but it tells us what people want to hear. And what we what you right. want to want to hear about is really important to us is because that's who we do this for. Right. We all have full time jobs. This is not our main job. We do this because we want to educate people and help them the way that our careers and our knowledge over these years have been able to help us help others. This is just how we extend this to even more people. So as always, let us know what you're interested in. We do read that stuff. Yes, I do read all the emails. I don't always have time to respond to them. I am trying to get to them. But please remember, we all have full time jobs on top of this. And some of us also have doing, are dumb enough to do PhDs on top of this as well. So it takes it's a lot. <laughs> but Thank you as always for listening. Come back soon. We'll have a lot of cool stuff coming up. Thanks, Matt.